Welcome to All Bodies on Bikes, the podcast, where all bodies are good bodies, all bikes are good bikes, and all rides should be celebrated. All Bodies on Bikes is a movement to create and foster a size-inclusive bike community. So join your hosts. I'm Maggie. And I'm Marley. As we explore the complexities of the biking world, help us break down barriers and create the world that we want to see. And don't forget that all bodies really means all bodies, not just larger bodies, but bodies of all sizes, ages, races, abilities, genders, sexualities, and beyond. Come along for the ride. Hi, friends. Thanks for hanging out with us on the All Bodies on Bikes podcast. Uh, we want you to be as involved as possible. And one of the easiest ways for you to be involved and to help us out is to go find the, I don't, Marley, do you subscribe to podcasts? Do you follow them? Do you like them? How do we get, in, how do I get involved with the podcast? That's a really good question. I feel like the, uh, the verb is always changing, mm -hmm. uh, whether you use Apple or Spotify or Google podcasts. Whatever one is your your listening app of choice, just hit, make sure you hit that little little button that gives us the good yeah. metrics. Yeah, <laughs> help us help our numbers look as good as we do. That shouldn't go into the thing. <laughs> no, it definitely should because we both do look great today. We're fantastic. But, but on a more serious note, um, every time you hit that subscribe button or follow or whatever it is. Um, and give us a rating or leave a review. It helps more people discover the show. And I don't know about you, but I'm always looking for new podcasts. And I do read the ratings and the reviews of other people. Um, so hopefully you like us and we'll give a positive review. Uh, but we also read all the reviews anyway. So if you're sick of me saying, um, or you want Maggie to speak up more or give us more of her amazing Southern colloquialisms, <laughs> let us know all those things. Yes. Um, there I go saying um again. Um, you know, it That's helps me it think. Is. I don't know what you, I don't know why you use it. But, <laughs> but yeah, um, we would really, really love your support. Like, follow, rate, share, yeah. subscribe, send it to your mom, your grandma, your friend who is trying to get you out on a bicycle. Um, and hopefully these episodes will resonate with you. I mean, send it to somebody you don't like and maybe that'll make them like you. Oh, that's a good point. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> I feel good about it. I feel good about it. <laughs> All right. Thanks for being fans of the All Bodies on Bike show. We wouldn't be here without you. Yeah. Um, and let's get on with the show. Uh, welcome back to All Bodies on Bikes, the podcast, where all bodies are good bodies, all bikes are good bikes, and all rides should be celebrated. Yeah, they should. How are you today, Maggie? I'm doing swell. How are you? I'm tired. Oh, um, I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mid, Mid South was this weekend. Oh, okay. Um, and I, well, I had signed up for the 100. And then I unsigned up for the 100. Okay. When I checked in, I was like, I'm just going to do 50. And then I, Bobby Wintel, uh, the event director. Yes. Is a very, very, very convincing man. <laughs> and <laughs> during the rider meeting uh, where, you know, he tells you what to expect and all the things. He said something that really resonated with me. He yeah. really, and I think this will really tie in with our guest today too, because I thought about her a lot during my ride. Uh, but Bobby said, you are stronger than you think you are. And um, I believe in you. And I thought, I should do the 100. It's going to be a beautiful day tomorrow. Heck my yeah. body's feeling good. I need some time alone on the bike. Screw it. I'm going to do the 100. And yeah, so you I are. did. Sweet. <laughs> And we'll talk about this with Meg. Um, spoiler alert, Meg Fisher is our guest, which we'll introduce her in just a second. Um, but I actually, I got last, um, which at Woo! most rides is like, okay, cool, you got last. But at Mid-South, they actually make a really big party of it. And so like, I've never had a champagne shower before. I got a champagne shower. Can't say that I anymore. I also was escorted the last 40 miles by um, a parade of Jeeps. So it's really cool. Like, um, and we'll Fantastic. we'll talk about this with Meg a little bit. But the Red Dirt Jeep Club um, runs support for the event, so they follow their race leaders, and they're out there as SAG in case you need support. But they, it, it's their tradition that they stay out there until the very end. So as I got closer and closer to the finish line, we kept picking up Jeeps along the way, <laughs> and I at one point I said to one of them, "Get in line, we're having a party." <laughs> Heck and, yes! Oh my, it just. 
at times I felt a little bit awkward, honestly. And I think we should do a separate episode just about Mid-South to have all these people following behind me, especially when I was like crawling up hills going like three, four miles an hour. But they kept insisting that they were there for me and they were, and they were there all night if we needed to be. Um, so I did it. And you go, Marley. today. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> but let's introduce our guest. Let's do it. Um, Meg Fisher is here with us today. Yes. And hi, Meg. Woo. Hey, Meg. Meg is a doctor of physical therapy, a two-time Paralympian, and an 11-time world champion cyclist. Super chill. She earned her doctorate at the University of Washington in 2014. Meg continues to race bikes professionally, predominantly endurance gravel and mountain bike events. She also runs her own physical therapy clinic in Missoula, Montana. She loves to play outside on the trails with her dog, Pax. And currently, Meg is focused on education and advocacy for the inclusion of paracycling categories in off-road events. Meg, we're so glad you're here today. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you. <laughs> I, I Honestly, Marley, I can't believe you're here. I'm kind of amazed I'm here. Yeah. You sound great. Uh, I kind of sound like I picked up a, a bad habit <laughs> <laughs> in Oklahoma. Well... <laughs> So I learned something uh, on the shakeout rides last year is that, you know, the folks who are up with the pack, you all breathe in a lot more dust than I do when I'm out there by myself. So I call it like the gravel cough. We all kind of have the gravel mm -hmm. cough and the gravel snot after these events where you're just disgusting. But I think it's a lot worse for fast folks because you are just riding in people's dust all day long. Uh, it's it's the same race for everyone. I, I, I always admire um, I, I remember years ago when I first started racing, I was uh, talking with a pro and I really admired her and the speed with which she was able to, um, she, she could carry through exterior events. So off-road triathlon, it was Shawnee Van Landingham. And she said, actually, it's the same race. And really it's harder for the people in the back. I mean, you're, you're out there a lot longer. And since I was out there longer, it really gave validation to my efforts. And then when I think about, um, like I've, I've gained some speed, but I'm still, I didn't set any land speed records out there on Saturday. Um, I just, I, I have so much respect and admiration for everybody along that journey. We all did the same course and I just, yeah. can't, I mean, your, okay. your, your ride, gosh, what was it? 14 hours? Yeah. About. And change. <laughs> yeah. Like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's funny because that's what I was expecting. Um, I went into the day because I did my first century at Unbound last year. Mm -hmm. And I think I hit like 1330. Mm -hmm. And I'm not at the same physical place that I was last year. I had knee surgery mm -hmm. about six months ago. Mm -hmm. And so I went into the day knowing I'd probably average about eight miles an hour. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I definitely babied my knee a lot, um, not pushing it and walking yeah. up hills. And so I hit my my 12 to 14 hour goal. 14 on the <laughs> on the end but it was a great day I got to hang out at some rest stops um they actually had the rest stops open the entire time mm -hmm. um which I part of me is like did they do it just because I'm me and they knew I would have made a stink about it if they wouldn't have been there <laughs> um but they all seem genuinely so happy exactly yeah. Yeah. even if they did even yeah. if they did that means they that everybody right else in front of me also got to experience their yeah. stops. Yeah. It means they did the right thing. So, yeah. yeah. So how did your race go overall? Do you feel good about it? Is this your season opener? T talk to us about that. Oh, this is the third race of my, wait. So that was the fourth race of this year for me. Wow. Um, I, yeah, there doesn't seem to be much of an off season anymore. My first race was in January, like January 6th, uh, down in Island Park, Idaho, which is just outside West Yellowstone. Um, it's called Fat Pursuit. It's okay. The 60K okay. fat bike race across sure. the snow. And then um, in February, about a month later, I was in Tucson. I got to race a duo with the Laura King. Yes. And we did 20, 24 hours in the old Pueblo as a duo. That was a journey. Holy moly. <laughs> uh, and then I was, uh, the next week I went up to Anchorage, Alaska, where I did a 50 K fat bike race. And then, so, uh, a week later I had two days home and then I raced mid South in Tulsa or no, we flew into Tulsa in Stillwater. Tulsa. Excuse me. Yeah. This was my fourth race and, um, uh, my third bike of the season. Wow. What an accomplishment. Heck yeah. Four uh, races, three months. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> like that ratio. <laughs> Excuse me. I also picked up a pack a day habit. Um, yeah. Yeah. So 
Ma- Maggie mentioned in your bio, uh, and we're skipping around a little bit, but you're a paracyclist specializing yes. in off-road events. Um, yes. So we're going to talk about both of those things. Um, I guess let's okay. start out with paracyclist. What does that mean? And what does that mean for you? So that's, that's a big question. So settle up. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, so para is a prefix I mean, in Greek that means alongside or beside. Uh, we often use it every day. Don't really think about it unless you took Latin in high school. I was one of those dorks. Um, and so uh, I mean, parallelogram, a paraprofessional, parachute, you know, we use it all the time. And it's a very generic, or not generic, but benign. Like it just like a neutral it descriptor it is yeah yeah and it's universal like if you said like it's used in europe it's used in spanish it's used in french it's uh used in german actually i lied i made that one up i'm guessing but chances are um there is a, a close facsimile of um and so it means it's you know like globally understood and uh I come from a world where I raced in the Paralympics and, and so Paralympics I mean para is right along the side, the Olympics and it truly, the Paralympics are as equally competitive as the Olympics. They happen in the same venue, many of the same events. Some events are only specific to the Paralympics, such as goalball. Um, and sometimes some of the soccer events are the numbers for people with visual impairments are unique. Um, I am advocating for there to be paracycling in off-road events because I want there, to, there ne- not just I want there to be, there needs to be a space for people with physical impairments. Physical impairments means, again, it's I say it in a very generic um, benign term because I work in healthcare. Like I don't talk about disabilities because dis means not the opposite mm-hmm. of ability. And in para sport, it's the celebration, the definition and the exploration of ability. So I I don't believe in disabled sports. I think that that is a true contradiction. I I believe in para athletes, para sport, para is my soapbox. And I think it is, um, I think it's good. And so I I think it's physical. It's it's essential. It's crucial. Sorry. Keep going. No, no, no. Sorry. Apology not accepted. Um, (laughs) I'm glad somebody else does that. Uh, I, uh, physical impairments means, um, it can mean a lot of things. It could be, uh, in a a sense like sight and being visually impaired does not mean there is no sight. There is a a scale of visual impairment. And honestly, to be a para-athlete, there is a little bit of discrimination. Like you have to have a, um, a certain prescription in your glasses or loss mm. of sight to be considered visually impaired or visually impaired enough to race in parasport. Like just needing glasses to read or glasses to read to see distances. Yes, you do have an impairment. Your vision is impaired. It is not impaired enough. Um, there are other physical impairments such as amputations, whether that's uh, congenital, meaning they were born with that or an acquired limb loss or limb length discrepancy um, from trauma, um, from illness, cancer, all sorts of things. Yeah. yeah, all sorts of reasons. Uh, it could be in hands, fingers, shoulders, or, I mean, really anywhere, feet, legs. Um, often people with um, amputations seem to be the most visible and easy to classify people because you, you can't really hide it. Um, <laughs> and then uh, often we see people who use wheelchairs for mobility and maybe have had um, a spinal cord injury of some port, some kind. Um, again, that can be from genetics like spina bifida, like you're born or congenital, congenitally, or it could be from an acquired injury later in life. Also, you can have tumors of the spine and that can also cause um, hiccups. In, in the neurological system that people who've had stroke and that maybe hemiplegia, um, sto- uh, plasticity, uh, contractures, uh, there's a, there's a, a long list. And so I have made a connect, or uh, sorry, I'm travel. My words aren't super good. I'm awfully tired from this weekend. You're doing um, wonderfully. Great. Yep. And I mean, we'll get into this, but uh, I was, the reason I am a para-athlete is I was involved in a really bad car accident about 20 years ago. And I um, had a really bad head injury. And part of the area in my brain that was injured was my word finding area. So I had to relearn to talk. And so when I'm really tired, it's 
hard to pick up up. I think when we're all tired, we have troubles with word finding. Mine's just a little more pronounced that I just can't talk very well. But let me try again. Um, so I've created guidelines to help race organizers understand what, and not just race organizers, excuse me, but like the general population understand what is a physical impairment that enables somebody to race under the, the para cycling classification. I've had race organizers reach out because pr prospective athletes have maybe said that like, Oh, I have, I have diabetes. Is that a qualifying physical impairment? It's, well, it sucks to have diabetes. I mean, I don't have it. I guess I don't want to portray that that's what it is. I mean, it must be some work and challenge understanding that um, disease, but that is not a an example of a qualifying impairment to be a para-athlete. Sure, um, that makes sense. Yeah, that um, makes going back to the Paralympics real quickly, it's mm -hmm. one of my favorites to watch because yeah. there's actually like more events to watch because of all the different classifications. Yeah. So instead oh. of just like, you know, the 400 meter run, there's like, I... I'm, I don't even know, but there's a lot of different yeah. groups that are running that event and yeah. meddling, which is, yeah. I love seeing people succeed. Um, yeah. And so it's a really, really fun thing to watch. Oh, I'm, I'm stoked that you watch. Uh, it's really exciting. Um, in the States, more and more coverage is being shared with the Paralympics. It used to be something that you pretty much had to search for on like ESPN, the Ocho or something like that, or it was only on YouTube. Um, and it's great to see it, uh, more visibility. I think if you watch the last games, pretty much every commercial had an Olympian and a Paralympian in it. That was not the case when I raced. Um, and when I first was injured 20 some years ago, I didn't understand the level of athleticism and value people with physical impairments offers, um, and humanity, like the, the value in humanity, let's just put it that way. Um, and I, so therefore like I wanted to hide, I wanted not to be seen as anything other than able. I didn't want to mm -hmm. celebrate and I, I don't need to like go around and have people like pat me on the back or, um, really like, I guess like I I'm contradicting myself when I say celebrate, but I don't, I don't need fanfare, I guess is what I mean. Yeah. It's like, I just want the acknowledgement or, um, cause I'm still a human. My physical yeah. impairment doesn't define me. And initially I thought it might. And so, um, as long story short, I just, is I think that that's a more, common experience. I mean, the human experience is more similar than it is dissimilar. So I suspect my journey is, um, ref is reflected. And I think in general, I can jump right into it. Like we all have scars. We all have obstacles we've overcome and just many of them are like behind their eyes and, you know, you just can't see them or they're underneath their clothes, like the invisible impairments or the invisible scars. And I just happen to wear mine incredibly visibly. And is that one, um, puppy dog coming in do we join in the show <laughs> yeah uh Lacey just oh, opened Lacey. my office door so I'm gonna go shut the office door um oh my gosh, so Lacey, that way I we don't you. have the lovely sounds of Star Wars coming through I'm also um watching my nephew for a couple of days because it's his spring break yes. um I, I planned my life really well right 100 miles hang out with a seven-year-old for two days you know what could go wrong exactly it sounds like just you know you're learning Thank things you. Thank you. <laughs> and if I start to get off the track, Maggie, just kind of like, give, you guys can kind of be like, give me one of these. Cause sometimes I start to ramble. So if I, if I'm starting to like, I mean, like... I'm the queen, so I'll just follow you okay. wherever we're going. And then it'll okay, sound cool. like everybody's on track and that'll be fine. Okay. It'll work out. Okay, perfectly. cool. I just, I just want to make sure that you know, you have the ability and I can respond. This Thank actually you. feels like the perfect moment for me to tell you something. Yes. Uh, so I did SBT last year with yes. All Bodies. Yes. And we had a, a meeting with you before we all got to, to Steamboat. Mm -hmm. And Marlene was like, do you guys have any questions? And so I sent in some questions. And one of them was uh, like safe ways to break going downhill. Because mm. that was something our, our team had all talked about a lot. And your immediate reaction was breaks work. And you're like, you know, just be careful. Like if you're going to break don't do it quickly. You explained it a lot better than this because there was like <laughs> science and stuff. But basically just like if you're going to grab your brakes, you're probably going to hurt yourself more. It started raining about halfway through yes, SBT. Mm -hmm. I got to Cow Creek about that time. And mm -hmm. I just went through all of Cow Creek yelling at the top of my lungs. 
I don't have a front brake. Why would I have a front brake? Meg Fisher had told me I didn't have a front brake, so I can't use the front brake. Why am I even trying to grab the lever on the left side? That's not going to work. There's not a brake there because Meg Fisher told me there isn't. And I think you said my life multiple times. So I... if you're rambling, I'm just going to follow because so far it's worked for me. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. yeah brakes you know, only pretty... slow you down. So yep, um, exactly. in a race, you don't need them. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. What brake? Um, if if you all haven't had a chance to listen to other podcasts Meg has done. She just drops these like gems of knowledge. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if you remember saying all the things that you've said. Um, I often say things I don't remember saying, but one thing you said when we were talking about training for a long ride was that it's a snack parade. Just keep eating all day long. Um, and that if you're ever feeling sad, you're probably not actually, well, when you're on the bike, you're probably not actually sad. You probably just need to eat something. And I have thought about that every single time I've been on a long ride since we had that conversation. Um, so thank you. You have saved my butt many, many, many times with that knowledge. Oh, that makes me so happy. <laughs> well, let's get back to talking about the advocacy work that you're doing yes, in paracycling yeah. and specifically off-road. Um, yeah. wh why off-road? Why is that important? Oh gosh. Um, it's important because, because it's important. It's important that there is space. Um, the table is huge. That's kind of the analogy I use. Like if we're at a, we're at a banquet, okay, these races are, you know, invite everybody. And uh, sometimes people need to have, be called out, whether that's um, people, um, they have like a, a trans non-binary or a gender expansive category. They might need to like have an individual chair or multiple chairs pulled out for them. Um, and the people of different skin colors and races and, and, uh, Again, they may need to be called out. Moms, uh, oftentimes they need to be called out and invited because most races tend to be dudes. And I don't, I'm not trying to shame dudes and saying like, don't come or don't race. You're, you're doing great things too. There are other people that want to do the same things and have fun. It doesn't have to be, you know, uh, like, let me start over a little bit and say like I, every race organizer I've spoken with believes that their race is inclusive. I don't know any race organizer who is intentionally trying to be exclusive. Sure. They maybe just don't know how to send out the invitation or to pull out the chair. And so having folks like you, Marley, and um, folks like Abby and other people in the trans non-binary space, just nudging them to be, to do the things that they are intending to do. They just don't know how to do. And that's, that's my role right now. Um, and it's been great to you know, be that person in the off-road space. Um, initially I got into sport cycling in the off-road space. I live here in Missoula, Montana, um, and we're surrounded by trails. There's road riding, but I say mountain biking is way, way more better. That makes, that makes me happy to <laughs> yes. say it's more better. It's and so, better. um, initially I raced, uh, 24 hour mountain bike races as an able-bodied person. Let me change it. I was a para-athlete, but I raced in the able-bodied category. That makes sense. Is and, that because there was not a paracycling category? Oh, exactly. category. There wasn't. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -mm. Um, and again, that was back in the era when I, where I thought I had to be as fast as mm -hmm. an able-bodied athlete to be considered as good as. And I realized that that math doesn't necessarily check out. Um, and it doesn't have to. Definitely. Uh, and my physical impairment does enable me to be pretty darn quick. And now where I am in my life and experiences, I want to make sure that the chair is pulled out for people who have visual impairments, people who have hand impairments, uh, limited grip strength or um, visual impairments who use hand cycles. Um, I, it's not just about me. I'm, I'm the squeaky wheel maybe. And um, I want to make sure that the sport that's given me so much is able to give as much to as many people as possible. Because it, it, I mean, I could go on and on. This is, this is my passion. I mean, bikes basically are a motorized wheelchair. I mean, there, there's a machine, right? There's gears, yeah. and so the wheel is magic. It enables us to do all sorts of things. And I don't ride the same bike as you, Marley. We're different sizes. Our arms are different lengths. Our legs are different lengths. Maggie, I'm sure you're taller than me because I think everybody's taller than I am. <laughs> and um, and so we don't ride the same bike. Yeah. And then somebody who has a hand impairment, they may need a, a specific adaptation to be able to ride that bike. Or um, I have a specific, my adaptation is I ride mismatched crank arms. Um, I've been able to race 
around the world with people of a variety of physical impairments and watched how they've adapted their bikes or their prostheses or orthoses to enable them to ride bikes. And it becomes this very unifying, enabling tool. And I... I see uh, this is this is the opportunity and it's why you asked off-road is because gravel is unsanctioned right now. Mm -hmm. There are parasports or paracycling in road racing and in track racing. There's not in any mountain biking yet and mm -hmm. there's not in gravel. And as the U USA Cycling and UCI and the other international governing bodies kind of look at gravel and start to want to sanction it. No, but whatever they choose. I mean, there is already a, a you know UCI gravel worlds like, but there was no gravel worlds category for paracycling. And mm. I know there's certain yeah. there are certain criteria to be an Olympic sport or a Paralympic sport or um, UCI like regulated sport has been represented by multiple countries. Um, has to have the right numbers, and right now the numbers are small. Um, that said, fifteen percent of the world's population lives with a permanent physical impairment. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. It is a lot. Yeah. So, so let's, yeah, I, I, I think there needs to be a space for people to explore and redefine their abilities. And the bike can be a very forgiving place to do that. Because in every physical therapy clinic, what do you see? A bike. On the sidelines of every sporting event, what do you see? A bike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so it's, it's a, um, it's a truly uh, a universal sport. It, it really is. Um, and I love that. I love, um, hearing about, you know, the adaptations that you made to your bike with the different crank arms. Um, and you know, I, I don't know if I want to call it able-bodied or folks without a physical impairment. Mm -hmm. We make adaptations to our bikes all the time, whether it's, you know, raising our handlebars, changing the position of our saddle. It's the same thing. It's making your equipment work for you. Um, and I just love the advocacy work that you're doing. I remember at Steamboat last year, you brought a team of 30 ish people. Is that right? I think they were 50. 50. Okay. Oh, so sure. 50. Right. I mean, I, I, across the, the different, I mean, I don't know. I, I didn't get the, the final numbers, but there were a lot of athletes that came. Yeah. And you know, you are kind of like the, the beacon of light for a lot of these folks. They see you do it. You did a lead boat last year, which means a hundred mile mountain bike ride in Leadville. And then the very next mm -hmm. day, what is it? 144 mile gravel ride? Yeah, it's 106 miles in Leadville and then 144 at Steamboat. So it makes a nice round 250 miles. Wow. In two days, in two days, <clears throat> in two days. <laughs> with a I remember standing at the finish train. line, watching you finish Thank and you. just seeing the outpouring of love and support. And it wasn't because you're a paracyclist. It's because you are who you are. And yes, we're really dang proud of you because um, that's an accomplishment for literally anybody. Um, and I don't Heck know yeah. where I'm going with this, except to tell you that I'm really proud of you. You make me cry. <laughs> you you make don't need me an outcome all the time, that. Meg. Um, okay. Back to the advocacy one more time. Uh, <laughs> I just want to make sure that race directors and event directors and basically anybody, if you're trying to figure out how to do this inclusion thing, figuring out how to get paracyclists there, how to get, you know, folks of differing abilities there, talk to Meg, get in touch with Meg. She, like she said, she wrote guidebooks, um, and pay her for her work because this work, um, needs to be done to get more people to the table, trying to grow sport. Um, Meg is your person. So get in touch and we will have her contact info in the show notes. Um, but really just expanding the world of sport to so many people. And, you know, Maggie and I can both attest to the difference that sport has made in our lives yeah. and so can millions of other people. So Meg, you really are doing just some amazing work. I, I appreciate that. That's really kind of you to say. It's, of course. Um... We're here to, to, I don't want to say pimp you out because that is not appropriate. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we'll lift each other up. Hey, you know, there you go. That's the appropriate wording. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you just had a film come out. Can you yeah. tell us about that? Yeah. And I love it because there's a young athlete in it. Um, so tell us the story of High Road. <laughs> it's, um, High Road is a film that you can watch on Vimeo. It was uh, awarded one of their staff's pick of the year. You can watch it on YouTube. You can watch it just about anywhere. It's been making the the tours of all the the film festivals. I can't name them all, um, big like, and small. From Tell you ride Banff. Tell yeah, Banff Film Festival up in Alberta. Yeah. Now it's making an international tour. Uh, Tell you ride the Bicycle Film Festival on festival on its international tour. I was very fortunate to be able to travel with it to Amsterdam, and um, it's it's it'll be in Cal I mean it's it's everywhere. Um, 
it's 11 minutes. So it's not a huge chunk of your day and it's a, it'll hit you in the feels. It's, it's a great one. Um, I'm grateful for the, for Cannondale who saw the value in showing this story, like the importance, because this kind of goes back to like why paracycling, why event organizers, I think need to have paracyclists is because it's not necessarily like the folks that are at the event or at the race. It's that people who come in contact or who, who, who maybe just see me saying like, okay, you guys, I'm not a super tall person. <laughs> um, I'm not a super big person in any dimension. Maybe I have a, a large personality, but I mean, if you just see me walking by, like you just see a little one-legged girl, I'm not to be stereotypical, but like one-legged girl, like riding by. And if I'm passing you, I will tell you good job. I will tell you hi. And then I will drop you like a bad habit. Um, <laughs> and so like, and then you get to wrestle with like, oh, I just got passed by somebody who's a lot smaller than me. And often a lot of people pass me too. I'm not trying to say I'm some amazing athlete, but um, you are, we'll say that you don't have to. <laughs> yeah. Well, back- but I would also say that me and Maggie are amazing athletes. Like right. being fast yes. does not make you an amazing athlete. Oh, for sure. Yes. Thank you. I didn't mean to infer that by any stretch of the imagination, (laughs) but going back to high road, it goes to like, you can see yourself reflected in, I think, hopefully me and, but definitely in Jack, um, Jack Barry, um, we share this film together. He's a a young paracyclist and a paraathlete. He, he had cancer come into his life when he was young and let's just give a quick fuck cancer. Yes. Let's do that. Um, The kid was magic. He was, and he still is. Okay. Um, When I go to those film festivals, everyone goes, where's Jack? And I feel like a giant disappointment because everybody (laughs) loves Jack. And if you watch the film, he, I can tell you, he is even better in person. Um, It follows the story where um, I got to be his physical therapist and this is out there in the world. So I'm not breaching HIPAA. Um, I was his physical therapist and I knew Jack Gosh, before he was Jack, I knew his mom who played college tennis. I also played college tennis on the same team. So I knew Jack before Jack was Jack. And then I got to watch Jack grow up and just be in awe of his, him being him. And then when cancer came into his life, uh, the whole town came together. There are still signs all over town that say Jack's army, because um, we all wanted to support him and his family. He's got two younger brothers. His mom works in pediatric ICU and his dad is a firefighter in town. So, I mean, this family just does good for our community. Canada was able tears. to, yeah, Jack was, um, the fact that ca- cancer picked Jack, I mean, we were just heartbroken. And then to see him rise above is, uh, that's the story. Like it goes from it just see, seeing him come back to his strength. It, this film follows him in, in starting his first bike race because for like he he rode bikes. He 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 jumped himself, hucked himself off off all sorts of stuff. And then when cancer came into his life, it really put a giant hiccup and damper for a while. And this was his first bike race afterwards. And knowing me, he kind of saw there was hope. Like um, I mean, he was a teenager when he lost his leg. And you can imagine how devastating that could be. It didn't stop. It hasn't stopped Jack. Um, we raced together in his first race and it's, it's, it's incredibly special. It was an honor to get to ride with Jack and truth be told, Jack and I have actually spent more time together on the tennis court than we have on bikes together. He made the varsity tennis team when he was a freshman in high school. Dang. Yeah. And, um, he's trying to get me back out on skis. We haven't skied yet together, but, um, he and I, we hang out, like we go play video games. Uh, we text, we get coffee. He is one of my favorite people. And he's often, he's pretty much my reason. Like I'm going to cry. Like, uh, (laughs) it's okay. Me and Maggie already did. I didn't have anybody who kind of looked like me and not necessarily that we have to have people that look like me, but it, it helps to give us an example to follow. Because being the first in anything, it's it's kind of hard. It's kind of scary. We don't know what to expect. And um, I want to make sure Jack has a place and people like Jack have a place in sport and they see themselves reflected and they see the opportunity and possibility instead of um, kind of where I was, where people just said, like, don't expect to don't expect much of yourself. Um, I was told I'd never walk again. I was told I'd never um, to keep my expectations low. Um, I realized that was said out of kindness from healthcare providers, 
However, that could have been incredibly limiting. Instead, Definitely. My, my stubbornness, which is not a bad thing, but my stubbornness uh, said, I'll show you. And um, I want to make sure Jack doesn't have to find that extra stubbornness. I want him to drive all that energy into his joy, into his happiness, into his future. You are a phenomenal human, Meg. Um, I'm going to switch topics a little bit, if that's okay. Um, can we talk about the Olympics? Um, which Olympic Games did you go to? Well, I've never been to the Olympic Games. The Paralympics. Excuse me. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> In my um, brain, they're all right. the Olympics. Right. And so, like, uh, and it's just a really interesting way to try to find or, like, challenge to how to kindly say, like, I am proud to be a Paralympian. As you should be. Oh, and not, not like, also, you're going to hear a small thing from me. I do not believe in the word should. Should is a subjunctive. It talks about things that have never happened or will never happen. And so I, I'll, okay, so I work in healthcare. I'm a physical therapist. And so when I tell people or when, I, when we speak, I will never tell somebody what they should do. Because I can't tell you how many people come into me or, you know, talk about like, oh, I should have stretched for the past 30 years and I wouldn't have this back pain. So should, could, would, wouldn't have this back pain. Again, like, well, 20 years ago, we can't change that. And um, they'll come into me, you know, a couple of days later, like, oh, I should have done my home exercises. And I'm like, I, well, we can't change the past. So I'm going to tell you what you need to do. Well, you're going to tell me what you want to do. Then I'm going to tell you what you need to do as a professional. And then we're going to come together and, you know, put that together to what you, what you can do in the future. So I, I, I don't should on people and I don't should on myself. Love so, that. um, as far as I'm concerned, like, yeah, there's the Olympics, and there's Paralympics and there, like, there's no should Marley. I'm not shooting on you. I'm not shaming you. I'm just saying like, <laughs> change that conversation. Like I'm really easy when it's like, you know, you, you get a cavity and you're like, Oh, I should have brushed my teeth. Well, you can't change that, but right. you, you, you have the cavity. It. You have the cavity. You can brush your teeth tonight. You can brush them right now. You can brush them tomorrow and you can prevent yourself from having a cavity. Something simple like that. So that's yeah. really quick and dirty. Well, one. let's talk about the Paralympics then. Yeah. Um, what I really want to know <laughs> is, I mean, yes, I want to know which ones you went to, but I want to yeah. know if the athlete village is as like wild as they say it is. Oh, so um, <laughs> as a paracyclist, I raced in London 2012 and in Rio 2016. The Olympic villages are great as are the Paralympic villages because they're the same place and there's the same housing, the same um, dining hall and the dining halls are huge. Do they have and, cuisines okay. from all over the world? Yes. Oh yes. Um, and it's like different aisles or lanes. It's like giant cafeteria. Uh, let's talk about the food because that's really the most exciting part. Um, <laughs> um, when I raced, I, I can, did four races in each games. So I did the 3K pursuit as well as the 500 meter time trial. Both of those events are on the track, the banked velodrome, if that helps. And then I also raced on the on the road. I did the individual pursuit, which is generally about 20 kilometers. And then I raced um, in the team road race, which is about 60-ish kilometers. So that meant my games were packed. The 3K pursuit was on day one. Oh wow. That means I didn't get to go to opening ceremonies. Mm. I I would often like get dressed up in my opening ceremonies outfit. In London, I did have somebody um push me in a wheelchair through the opening ceremonies because I did not want to walk. I wanted to save my legs and I didn't stay for any of the the shows. Um a lot of athletes choose not to go to the opening ceremonies because it is a big to do. What you don't realize is is that they have you get all dressed up in your costume. And then you wait for the bus or it's a long walk to the, where the venue, show be. the venue, yeah. that's the word. And in Rio, it wasn't anywhere near the village. Actually, the village mm. was kind of off on its own. In London, they were right next to each other. And then you have to stand in line for a long time. And then you get to walk around the stadium and then you sit and then you watch the show and then you have to reverse the order of operations. So it's a long night. Yeah. And if you have a 3K pursuit the next day, which is actually two races, if you, you do well, it's a qualifying race as well as the medal race um, in the morning session and in the afternoon session. So it just means you don't get much fun. And then you get a day off of recovery and then you have the 500 meter time trial. And then you have a few days where you start doing road reconnaissance. You go ride the road race course and you just try to memorize it. Then you have the 
individual time trial, day rest, final road race, closing ceremonies. So it's like, that is a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. So back to the food. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> That's what everyone wants to know. London was amazing. Yeah. Like, absolutely the best food I've ever had. The Italian line, delightful. The Asian yeah. line, wonderful. Um, the British line, pretty darn good. You know, British people don't often get like a lot of kudos for their food, but Boena, That's true. the African line, oh. oh, I mean, there was like a table of cheeses. Okay. Like, sure. And believe it or not, there's a McDonald's it was in, <laughs> in the cafeteria and in Rio, there was a McDonald's on campus because McDonald's is a giant sponsor. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting to see who goes to the McDonald's line. Um, generally, um, kind of the, the faster road cyclists, we tend to be kind of a little picky about what we eat. We tend to be pretty small. So I had to really force myself not to eat very much in London. And I did not get to go to the McDonald's line. Mm. Um, one of my teammates, we had a pretty bad crash leading up to London, um, mm. big pile up. One of my teammates broke his jaw. So we ended up giving him all the McFlurries he could eat. <laughs> yes. Yes. And then those are and, good teammates. That support. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I separated my shoulder. It was it was a it was a rough game. And then um in Rio, the menu at the McDonald's is slightly different. You can get the little um parquejo, like the little cheese balls. Mm. Mwah, delicious. The food <laughs> in Rio for the American palate didn't quite hit us really well. We had a little hard time getting enough to eat. Mm-hmm. So we ended up hitting the um USA lounge. So every country has its own lounge. And so all of our sponsors like send like Oberto mm, beef jerky. So we're all like hoarding packs of beef jerky <laughs> and then like um, cereals, dried cereals and little packets of applesauce. We had to start rationing out our food because we were like just plowing through whatever snacks. There were supposed to be just snacks, right? But we didn't yeah. like what was at the cafeteria. So we just started hanging out in the lounge and you'd be, okay, only one pack it was it was fine. <laughs> One of my favorite things after the games were over, like, do you go sightseeing? Did you go to Ipanema Beach? Did you? Well, we all some of my friends. There was my friend from South Africa, another U.S. rider. We got on the bus. We went and looked at the the line for the, to go up to see the statue of Christ up on the hill. It's stunning. We looked at the line. We said, "No way, Jose." We went to Ipanema Beach, and instead of actually going to the beach, we went to a restaurant to eat. Nice. Yes. <laughs> I support it was, that. It was across the street from the beach. We <laughs> kind of looked at it. And we're like, well, it's over there. Let's go eat. We're hungry. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. So that's, that's just a true story. Um, yeah. yeah. I could listen to you tell stories from the Olympics all day, every <laughs> yeah. day. Mm-hmm. It was a, it's a wild experience. It's not something I ever thought I'd get to have. I think everyone when we're little, we maybe have this dream of being the next Bonnie Blair or whomever's in your generation. You're like, man, I want to go to the Olympics. When I got hurt, like, well, first of all, once I hit puberty, I realized, like, the Olympics, I'm not going to be the next Nadia Comaneci, okay? Like, that's who I was going to say was I really wanted to be an Olympic-level gymna- gymnast. Exactly. And then, yeah. you know, you, you hit college and you realize, man, I've hit these milestones. My ability to, like, go wear the stars and stripes on the, you know, the international stage is, you know, somehow over. Um, and then when I got hurt, I didn't realize that I could be a Paralympian if that mm. was a, in, in a, you know, a possibility. And again, I thought the Paralympics was less than oftentimes people think like the Paralympics and the special Olympics sometimes get confused. Mm. Um, and it's all out of kindness. It's not, nothing's malicious. Um, and it's just the special Olympics is for people with cognitive or developmental delays. Mm-hmm. And whereas there are actually some categories in the Paralympics for people who do have some intellectual impairments um, there's just a few. Um, so I can see why it's confusing, but the Paralympics people generally with physical impairments and it's, it's cutthroat, man. It's actually like sport at that level is beautiful, but it's also kind of ugly. I think any sport at that level yeah. can be that way when you've trained mm-hmm. so hard for something and that is what your entire life is about. It mm-hmm. can have a tendency to get ugly. <clears throat> yep. I, yeah. I'm so grateful for it and I'm grateful to have had those experiences. I'm also grateful to be retired from that, yeah. from that part of my life. But you're still racing hard. You're still racing bikes. 
Um, do you have a favorite discipline? You already mentioned that you do fat bike, gravel, and mountain biking. Um, do you have a favorite out of the three? Or I don't even know. Are there other disciplines you do? Well, I still, I don't race on the road anymore, but I love, I don't really have a favorite. I mean, bikes are bikes to me. Yeah. There's elements that I miss about the fixed gear track racing. That is a special type of awful. It is so painful. Um, but it's so cool to go so fast. You feel like, I feel like, like Maverick and a Mm. pilot, like, especially when you're motor pacing behind a motorcycle, like the moto, like you're in your little aero bars you're all tucked up, teeny, really, like you're slicing through the wind and you're just hitting left turn, left turn, left turn, left turn. And the G-forces are pushing you up the track, but you're driving it down the track and you just feel really cool. <laughs> um, same thing, I do miss the 20K time trial. That's probably my favorite. Um, in French, I think it's beautiful. Time trialing is contre le montre, meaning um, against the clock. Mm-hmm. And so it's, I think it's very beautiful in that it's the same course for everybody and you just need to choose the best line and apply force at the right time. Um, your body position and there's, it's, there's no team dynamics. There's no tactics. It's just like, do you have the engine to do it? Can you suffer? Can like, how deep can you go into that pain cave? Um, I took a lot of pride of how deep I could go in, into the pain cave. Like I think we've all, had really hard things in our lives that, you know, kind of show us the way and how deep we can go. And I feel like I can suffer with the best of them. And most of my, my medals have come from time trialing. I love it. I love, I love it. I have never done a time trial. The only time I ever went on a velodrome. Um, have you heard of Ron Daenerys? Yes. Um, Maggie, have you heard of Ron Daenerys? I have not. Um, so basically what it is, is it's, uh, I think it started in France, like a lot of bicycle things. I think we talked about that a couple episodes ago, but basically you're doing like a hundred K 200 K 400 K sometimes even more than that. And there's no winners. Um, and there's basically checkpoints that you have to go to in a certain order within a certain amount of time. And, um, I was doing a hundred K and we missed the time cutoff. Um, surprise, surprise to nobody. Uh, <laughs> but we decided to keep riding because, you know, there aren't winners. We, it, it was great, but the the route went past an outdoor velodrome, the Mary Moore Velodrome, actually up in uh, Seattle, which mm-hmm. Meg will talk about the University of Washington here in a couple minutes because we both went to school there. Um, and I I was with my friend, and we said, "Let's go ride our bikes in the velodrome. We're never going to get this chance." And so we took our uh, randonneuring bikes with full fenders and baskets and all the gear on the velodrome, and it was so fun um i did not have the g forces to get up the side i was too scared but i would like to try it again i think it would be a really fun challenge well the the marymore track is a really special one because it's actually 400 meters it's giant is that not the normal size oh no 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 no. (laughs) (laughs) it's huge and it's um made of cement so actually because it's so big that the corner is actually I can realize how intimidating they looked. Mm-hmm. But you can basically stop in those corners. They're so that that banking is shallow. Yeah, it, it's not super steep at all. No, yeah. you, you on your fully fendered, decked out bike, you could have gone anywhere. And generally, just as a by the by for those listening, like geared bikes cannot be on the track at the same time as a fixed gear bike because it's just yeah, not it's, safe. It's unsafe. Holy smokies, it's not yeah. safe. Yeah, um, and so. Yes. So any bike can ride on a velodrome. However, you must have a fixed gear bike and your local velodrome will have a little introductory course just so everybody's on the same page, same language. Um, yeah, they're super fun. Velo- like I've ridden at Mar- Marymore. It's a hoot. Um, but 400 meter tracks are not an international competition. So unfortunately, most race events like national championships can't come to Seattle and experience, experience the joy that you felt there. But Interesting. Um, I did not yeah. know that. So a 250 track is the standard distance. So most races, or excuse me, most tracks around the world are 250. The UCI in Eagle, Switzerland has a 200 meter track. It's so steep. Yeah. It's wicked It's got to make the corners real steep then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, like the most popular one in the States is in LA, in Carson. Okay. It's a 250 track. Uh, it's like... Th- it's pretty darn steep. If you're not going, I think it's like 
17 miles an hour. I'm I'm kind of forgetting. It's it's, it's a long, it's like 10 years ago. Um, it's not 10 years ago, but it's long enough ago that uh, if you're not going fast enough, you will actually slide off the wooden track. <laughs> like you need to be, you need to be going a certain speed to create centripetal force to push yourself to stick to the um, track. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. It's real fun. <laughs> I don't know if it's amazing or horrifying. A little oh. column A, a little column B. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Maggie, I've been asking Meg lots of questions. Do you have any questions for Meg? If not, that's okay. Too. I'm I'm just kind of along for the ride today. I'm enjoying just listening to you guys. I'm okay, surprised that you're both still wheel. functioning. Exactly. Got <laughs> you. I got you. Um, can we talk? So we've talked about your advocacy work. We've talked about your racing career. I would love to talk about your work as a doctor of physical therapy. Um, so you went to the University of Washington. Darn tootin'. <laughs> same. Um, I don't talk about Not that same. much as uh, being a University of Washington alumni, but I feel like we should throw it out there as both distinguished alumni. Yes. Um, so what is it? What does your day to day look like? Oh, goodness. Um, I'm just was going back. My time in Seattle was transformational. I, I, I loved it. I actually came out after I graduated from my bachelor's. I have a degree in athletic training. So I'm a certified athletic trainer. We prefer to be our initials to be ATC, not CAT, even though we call ourselves <laughs> certified athletic trainers. We're not cats, we're ATCs. <laughs> um, so yeah, I got to, I worked for UW. I was in the athletic training department. And meaning if you watch the Huskies and somebody got a boo-boo and ran out on the field, that was me. I love doing that stuff. It's a cute injury. Helping people return to sport is super duper fun. I wanted True. I came back to Montana. What's that? True story, not to interrupt, but after I tore my meniscus, Meg was one of the first people I called. Um, because it was like, a, oh my God, can I even walk on this to get to the doctor? And you gave me some great advice to rest, to ice. Um, and you, you really did help me through that injury. So thank you. Oh, it's a true privilege. privilege. Um, it goes back to like, uh, I got really, really hurt. And initially I was going to be a wildlife biologist. I wanted to be the next Jane Goodall, but for big cats. And so, yes. um, when I got hurt, I, you know, that career changed. I knew I couldn't be hiking through the jungles. And it went back to when I was a kid, I always wanted to be a physician and wanted to help people. And it sounds way more twisted than it is, but like in my pretend mind, my Barbie dolls used to break their legs and I'd have to fix them. I'm not in some like warped toy story, like blow up dolls or something like Like I was just wanted to help people. And I never thought I was smart enough. So I waited till after I had a concussion and well, some brain surgery, you know, my pupils were fixed and dilated and I wasn't breathing on my own. Oh my God. A whole new personality. I used to be painfully shy. Now I can't shut up. <laughs> um, so I waited to, you know, kind of redefine myself after everything was taken away, my physical ability, my mental abilities. I realized, you know, over time that like, I wasn't as dumb as I thought, you know, and I'm more able than I thought and physically and mentally. Mm -hmm. So I really was grateful for my physical therapists my physical therapist was also a dual credentialed athletic trainer, physical therapist. And I wanted to be just like her. She was a, a triathlete as well. So I was like, man, I want to, I want to do a triathlon. So 11 months after I lost my leg the second time, cause I'm lucky enough to have two amputation surgeries. I did my first triathlon and then, um, I did that for a while. And then I did, you know, 24 mountain bike racing. And then I ended up su suffering a pretty you know, bad injury cycling. It was a iliopsoas tendinopathy. I had hip flexor tendinitis and I thought my cycling career would be over. I went to PT school because I wanted to know more. I want to know how I could help people more than just, not just with my athletic training degree. I just wanted, I wanted to grow my understanding. I also got my EMT certification in the middle there. So I felt like I yeah, got my acute injuries dialed. I want to know as much as I can. So UW has a super strong uh, medical school, the physical therapy programs under the medical school. It was awesome. It was like drinking knowledge from a fire hose every day. I mean, it rains knowledge in Seattle, I guess, apparently. <laughs> like that. Um, I, I loved it. So now as a physical therapist, I have my own clinic here and it's I've I've worked full time kind of in between the national team and now I thought, you know, my racing career is over. I'm gonna really dive into physical therapy and it's hugely rewarding as my cycling career has kind of reinvented itself and grown. I with my own clinic, I can see patients as I want to and need to. So it's a, it's a cash pay basis. Cause we can, we can go, we can wax poetic about the healthcare system. Mm. Um, and now I, I have a lot of flexibility that I can provide care to my patients 
as they want it and as they need it. If that makes any sense. So we does. And got any questions? I mean, does I'm that still I, allow you to like have a fairly busy race schedule and travel around while still seeing mm-hmm. patients kind of with that flexibility? Exactly. Yep. Yep. That's um, awesome. it means that I don't see as many post-operative patients, meaning like if you have a new ACL, you see your physical therapist three times a day for, or three times a week for, you know, a couple months. I'm probably not your physical therapist for that because I do travel. Maybe in the winter, I'm your physical therapist for that. Um, and if you've met your deductible, go to see your traditional insurance-based physical therapist and use that. But if you've got like, you know, something that kind of is outside of that, like I, I, I see back pain, I see knee pain, I see tendonitis, I see, I mean, I see it all. Um, I've been working with people with physical impairments, like with, with their help re- um, returning to sport or returning to life. Let's talk about the sport of life, right? Like, yeah. Truly. Um, gravity never takes a break. Um, so we all have to have some level of strength. I mean, physical health is a lifelong prescription. So I work with people with uh, prostheses. I work with people with uh, paralysis. So it's just, I, 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 I love what I get to do. Helping people um, is really what I'm, I'm here for, I think, in this world. And where I went with with sport is that like I can see, you know, in a full time physical therapy clinic, like forty people a week. Well, if I go to an event, I can meet five hundred people. Yeah, and hopefully have a positive impact on their life and help them take knowledge home to move their lives forward and move the, forward the lives around them. And hopefully, have a, you know, resonate and let that that puddle ripple further. And so that's. I'm grateful for both both sides of my career. And I know that if this cycling career needs to change a little bit, I can go back to growing the ripple in my community through physical therapy. And I can take that that skill set anywhere. I've taken it as a UCI phys- physio uh, to pro teams in Europe. I've taken it everywhere. And at races with my teammates, I've been able to, like, you know, you, friends can call me and I can, I can help them. And, and to have that confidence and knowledge, it's, it's always good to have a doctor in the family. Definitely. Um, so, and I hope that you, you will allow me to ask this question, but please feel free to say no, if it's not appropriate. Um, a lot of our listeners, you know, might be folks who are in non-traditional bodies or, um, are maybe working on, you know, getting back into the sport of life. Um, do you have any advice, you know, for folks Mm -hmm. on where to get started, how to move your body safely without injury, any like best tips or practices there? Uh, well, first of all, movement is medicine. Full stop, period. <laughs> yep. Um, and I get so many people who get wrapped up in like, what should I do? Oh, yeah. I, did I say that word again? No, no, I don't think you did. Okay. But I, I get that all the time. And I realize it's said with genuine curiosity and hope and question. The bottom line is start somewhere and and don't, because should, I think, can add a level of uncertainty and question and anxiety Mm -hmm. that can become paralyzing if it's okay to use that word debilitating yeah where you don't you don't know how to start so you don't start it can become so Mm -hmm. daunting that you just don't even know right where or how do i want to go back to movement is medicine so just not just i know how that just seems minimizing i mean to say start somewhere anything whether it's twiddling your fingers tapping your toe. It can be relatively small. And sometimes we give less value to the small things like, well, it's so small. How can that make a difference? There's even in like, we we hold some sports teams to a very high standard and put them on a pedestal. Those, those kind of elite athletes are still looking for marginal gains. They're looking for like, how do you take Whoever you want to choose, choose, choose your favoritest, whatever sport athlete it is. Don't care. Like, how are you going to make that one person better? So it, it can be like, okay, we need to make their diet that 1% better. Mm-hmm. We need to make their sleep that 1% better. We need to help their, the the muscle, if you will, between your ears, that 1% better. The sports psychology or period, just psychology. better. We need to make their digestion better, what have you. So all of a sudden you can choose those maybe 10 areas and all of a sudden you get a percentage here, percentage here. And then you get somebody, you know, trying to make that 
100, what we thought was 100%, we're trying to make that 100% person 110% better. And really, if you think about it, we are all working at 100%. I don't know anybody who's super lazy. Truly, like, truly, like, we're all doing the very best we can. On any given day. I'm going to fight you on that. Like, you are doing the best you can. So who, who am I to say, okay, now in that pie chart, you've got like, hours set aside for work. You have hours that must be set aside for sleep. You must have hours set aside. I'm not going to ask for permission. You got to have time to just fuck around. Okay. Like yeah. those hours are precious. Okay. Don't yeah, worry about definitely. cussing. They gave us an explicit rating. So, <laughs> okay. We're going to lean into it. I'm going to lean into it. You got to have fucking around time. Okay. <laughs> right. You also have to have sleep t- time set aside for like cooking, cleaning. Like all of a sudden, if you think about all the things you do in your day, your pie chart is awfully full. And part of that pie chart also is set aside for your immune system and digestion and those things. So if all of a sudden you have somebody like you have a, that gets wedged in there, an illness, a head cold, um, Marley, if I may use you, please say like you have all of a sudden you have a meniscal injury, like all of a sudden that gets wedged into an already full pie chart. So something has to be taken away because you can't grow a pie chart. That's, that's not math. Okay. So you, then you got to think, okay, how can I maximize those, those areas, those, those, those slices of the pie chart to make room to, for, to address your injury, to heal your injury or to prevent injury. And so I just want to give people like validation that I know you're doing well. Like if I could give you a high five, I'd give you a high five. All right. And if you need somewhere to start, start somewhere. And whether that's walking, biking tends to be really good. I can tell you it's not the perfect sport. I know we're talking about bikes a lot. If you don't, if biking's not your thing, okay, great. What find is? Some, yeah, find something that is. Swimming, aqua size, uh, ula, which is like, you know, kind of a dancey thing here in town. I don't know if it's internet. I don't know if it's nationally like, you know. I have not heard dancing, of it, but it sounds fun. Dancing, Pilates. I mean, nothing is actually perfect and 100% like the thing, like yoga wonderful. Yoga is the only thing you do. It's not the best thing. It's not, but not like the only bestest thing. Like CrossFit. CrossFit's good. I'm not going to say it's the perfect thing either. I'm not saying cycling is the perfect thing. Like you really have to have a balanced diet of nutrition and fitness and strength and stretching. I mean, it's really, it is a, it's, it's all of it. You can't just do one thing. Yep. Um, and so do a little bit of everything if that's what makes you like scratch, scratches the itches or the itch. Um, yeah. And I, I just want to advocate, make it joyful, figure out. And oh I think gosh. Meg, you were alluding to this, you know, biking's not your thing. Just figure out what it is that's joyful for you. Yeah. Um, there... I was going to say, what's bringing you joy these days? We're going to wrap up with a couple last questions because we could talk to you all day. Um, oh, can we? Uh, I mean, you would, yes, but the all podcast right. guests might drop off. Or the listeners. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's keep so what's real. bringing you joy these days? I've been cooking a lot. Fantastic. Um, there's an, I've, I, it's called the half baked harvest. There's a, oh, mm, is it a book? Yes. It's okay. also an Instagram. Their Instagram, like the way they show food is downright slutty. Like I just like, I love it. Like she is able to describe food and uh, like the videos for her food. Like, we will put a link to the half baked harvest in yeah. our show notes for this one because we definitely have to check that out. Delightful. Okay, so that's that's bringing me joy. I spent a lot of time with my. Um, I have a friend staying with me. He's in between houses, so we and I were like we're cooking together. It's great. Um, my partner and I we love to cook together. She's the one that turned me on to this. Um, and then I love to spend time with my mom. My mom's great. She's in town. Um, she's. In her seventies, and we're continually trying to find ways to bring movement into her life because she's mm. somebody that like going to the gym is not her thing. Okay, fine, but you know, again, the sport of life is for everybody, um, and so trying to you know nourish her physically and nutritionally. Um, I love my dog, mm. but you guys, my cat. I'm a cat lady. Yes. Okay. All right. My cat's got one eye. His name's Cy, short for Cyclops. And he is aggressively affectionate. Oh, yes. <laughs> and when I went through my divorce, people, you know, you're, let's talk about like hard things. We've, we've all been divorced from something or mm-hmm. someone. Okay. It's hard. Sometimes yeah. it's a woman and like me and you. Out. 
oh yeah, I got my heart hurt. All right. And my heart is good. Um, but my counselor was like, okay, so this is a shout out to like having a counselor. Okay. Like she's like, well, yes. what are you going to do? Are you going to have, go like take a bubble bath, go get a massage. Like what's your jam? I'm like, well, cuddling with my cat. And so like, I legitimately set aside time. I prioritize holding my fluffy kitty. Um, he's wonderful. Um, so that just goes to show like what works for somebody doesn't work for someone else. And if it's as small as holding your cat, like if it's good to you, it's good to you. Yes. Yeah. Like, the most powerful thing is placebo, right? Like if you believe you're going to feel better, you will feel better. And then let's pull back the curtain on that. Like, and it's great. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. Um, and thank you for sharing all of this. Um, Absolutely. So we have three last questions for you. Um, yes. Two that we ask everybody and one specific to you, because I know that you're not able, similar to me, we're not able to do this work alone. You know, going to races mm -hmm. is expensive. Mm -hmm. Bikes are expensive. Clothing. Mm -hmm. So who is helping you do this work? Who's supporting you in that? Yeah. Uh, I, I, for so many reasons, I would not be here alone. I'm not, wouldn't be here without the help of others. Um, a woman, and her name's Diane Dassinger. She pulled me out of the car that was rolled eight and a half mm -hmm. times. That's the car accident I was in with my first love. Okay. She, uh, my first love died and I was, uh, I was on my way out. And this person who was untrained, she was a, a waitress at a local diner pulled me out. Wow. Okay, so let's not belittle anybody and say anybody can save a life. Okay. Let's just go back to that. So I've had so many people along the way who have helped lift me to where I am now from Diane to my physical therapist, Tasha to companies like Cannondale, like that they're the, they reached out to me and said, you know, we think you're doing something important and we want to be a part of it. I owe them a debt of gratitude. Rafa is another large sponsor um, or large supporter. Like they, um, let's just be also quite honest. Like there is not a lot of money floating around in the cycling world. Like not for athletes like me and that's okay. Like I'm not, I mean, it's not, but it is. That's just the way it is. And so I'm grateful for the companies that are able to support me. Um, Pac is another one, pro bike gear. Um, but I still have also have my job as well. So I can pay the mortgage for the, you know, the house that is, God bless it. Continually trying to fall around, fall down around me. Like <laughs> the paint keeps peeling, uh, the light stopped working. You know, so I'm doing the best I can, and I know I can't do it alone. So I'm grateful for the patients um, who ask me to be to join them on their journey. I'm grateful for the companies that ask me to come speak. I'm grateful for the race organizers who are able to support me in the work I do because I recognize that race organizers aren't doing it to make it rich in general either, and yeah. neither am I. I'm not doing this to you know buy myself a, a Tesla or anything like that. I mean, if you saw my car, I've got a big crack along it. The fender is falling off. I do ride a bike that is worth more than my car. And I do I get too. To do, yep. And I get to do that because of companies like Cannondale who are able to, to share that with me. Um, Pac and, um, has been, they're going to send me to, or help get me to migration this year. Cause I have this desire of bringing paracycling internationally and, we live in a very privileged first world country. And my mom lived in the Dominican Republic for 13 years. And so when I would go down there, um, I often got stared at because people who have the same physical impairment as me would be in wheelchairs. And sometimes those wheelchairs would have three wheels or only two wheels. And so even their wheelchair wasn't fully functional. Mm. And I, and for me to have, you know, to be a bike racer, I know how lucky I am. And then to have a prosthesis that works, gosh, how lucky am I? And then to have a running leg, gosh, that's one step luckier. And then I have a biking leg too. That my my friend actually made in his garage. Okay, let's just put that out there. Too. That's really cool. Um, and not to make light of it, but you left it on the plane yesterday. You were so tired. Ooh, yeah. So I landed in Missoula and I was a little. I just woken up and a little cross-eyed, and I walked off the plane and somebody yelled at me as I went down the gangplank. They're like, M Miss, Miss. <laughs> I'm like, what? What? She's like. I think there's a leg on board. It, is that yours? <laughs> I had to have the pilot go back on board to get my leg. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, I, it, oh. I love that story. It just like shows how human you are. You know, you, yep. you're an Olymp you're a Paralympian, you're a world champion. You've done all these amazing things. And sometimes you forget your leg in places and that's just the way it's going to go. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> 
I, I, I'm, I'm very human. Um, and this morning, I think we've all, it's Monday morning. I, I went to work. I had the very great privilege of joining some people on their healthcare journeys and helping them overcome their obstacles. And now I get to be here this afternoon speaking with you all. It's uh, 20 years ago when I woke up from my coma, if I'd known this is where I'd be, I wouldn't believe it. Yeah. And that's, this is a tent time when the subjunctive tense is, is, is appropriate. Like I, I would not believe it. Um, and to know that in, you know, in the present tense, that this is what's happening. It blows me away. And so I, I'm very grateful to have met both of you and, um, Marley, you've changed my life. Maggie, you don't even know it. So uh, thank you. Oh, thank you, Meg. Yeah. Um, and to close out, we have two last questions. I'm going to let Maggie ask both of them because um, she's Fantastic. been a little quiet today. I have. So. That's okay. um, great. Thank we're you. We're co-hosts. We are. We're co-hosting. Um, the first question is, what would your, if you could just plan out a perfect day on the bike, what would that look like? Mm. Generally, there's a sunrise involved. Um, okay. I think back to this this one ride that it still strikes as probably one of my best rides ever. Uh, there's a some oh, recreational space north of town called the Rattlesnake, and I remember um, going up early because before it gets really hot, because it does get real hot here in Montana. Like, you may watch this show Yellowstone. That's not real life. Okay, that's what <laughs> it's it's filmed like 40 minutes from me, and I can tell you. Not real life. Anyway, so okay. the perfect day was I woke up before, you know, before sunrise and as it started to glow, um, rode up into the woods. Um, the relative humidity was still just a little bit high. The the smoke wasn't too bad yet. And I, I just rode up, 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 up to the top of this hill. And I just came down um, the other side of the valley and came through this clearing. And there's uh, a break in the trees where there's just this uh, meadow of grass. And I was coming from the west, so I was headed east. And I watched the sun come up over the trees. And uh, I just felt incredibly lucky that I got to be there. And I was all by myself. And um, that my body could take me to the top of this hill. And my body could take me down this hill. And that I got to be alive because uh, nobody thought I'd be here. And um yeah. And, or have the ability to do that, and let alone I didn't think I'd have the ability to do it. So to be there, and um, I've had setbacks during the during my life where I've had my abilities taken away again and questioned whether they'd come back. So to be there, like that's the perfect day for me is just to be able to like hear your breath, feel my breath. Um, that's perfect to me. Yeah. Yeah. And then our second question that we always close with that was actually inspired by you. I don't know, Marley, if I've even told you this, but I listened to multiple podcasts with you and everybody wanted to talk about the same thing, which is great because you like bikes and so talk about bikes, but you know so many other things. And I was like, somebody ask her something else. So now we ask everybody that's on the show, what is something that you wish you got to talk about more? What would I like to talk about more? Sorry for the pause, folks. I, there's not a problem. So many things that I get real excited about. I get really excited talking about human potential. Mm. I think that often gets talked like I get to graze upon it, like when I talk about my physical yeah. therapy career. But I just want everybody to see and feel the potential that like I see when I look at people, like. It's staggering and maybe a little frightening, like what we're possible, like what we can do. Yeah. Because this is like not until we like get really uncomfortable do we realize like, holy shit, I did that. Mm -hmm. like, I didn't think I could do that. And man, that was uncomfortable. I'd rather not do that again. But like whether that's those like stories of Arctic explorers, like having stuff go wrong and yet overcoming that like endurance mm -hmm. by um, Alfred Lansing about the Shackleton expedition. Mm-hmm. My favorite book okay okay um and it's like talking about you know, the potential that we all have and that it's uncomfortable for us to explore it and i think the challenges we choose prepare us for the challenges we don't choose so i think talking more about and like speaking with people and empowering them to know that they can do it like i, 
I love telling people like, you're going to be okay. And sometimes just having somebody like me tell them that they're going to be okay. It's really fun to watch their shoulders drop and the smile come on their mouth. Like, really? I'm going to be okay. Yeah, buddy, you're going to be okay. <laughs> so, um, and like, you can do it like those, those little things, this against that seems so little, but really are monumental. Yeah. Yeah. And true story. Um, Friday night before mid South, I was having dinner with Meg Fisher. We were both having dinner at the Scratch House. Um, we're both we were both fortunate to be there. And Meg said, "I believe in you, Marley." And I thought about that repeatedly during my hundred mile ride. Um, and I, you know, at one point was kind of counting the people in my head who believed in me and how important it was for me to be out there. So, from the bottom of my heart, thank you, Meg. Thank you, Maggie. Um, thank you both for being in this world. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, and thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Really, yeah. really grateful. It's a little bit longer episode. I hope folks really stick around till the end. No, don't make that face. This is beautiful. <laughs> um, we don't have any limitations. We could talk forever. Thanks. Joe Rogan talks for two hours, like five times a week, and people listen to him. So I think our conversation is worth it. Absolutely. All right, Meg. Thanks, guys. Go get some rest. Take care of yourself. Yes. This is me telling you to take care of yourself because I know that you're capable of it. And be good to yourself. Uh, rest up. Oh, actually, before we go, though, where can folks find you if they want to find mm -hmm. more? Oh, uh, I mean, I think Instagram is pretty pervasive these days. It's pretty easy. At Meg Fisher. Um, just like M-E-G. And like a fish. Fish. F -I -S -H -E -R. That's it. That's an R. Okay. Um, we will have a link to that uh, in the show notes. Yep. I also have a website. It's called GoMegFisher.com. Okay. Great. So there you go. Um, you can... If I'm an email me that way, or you can message me through Instagram. You can, um, I'm, I'm highly motivated to get in touch with all of you. So let me know what I can do for you. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Meg Fisher and best of luck in all of your adventures this year. Yes. Um, I will, will be following along closely. Yeah. I'm excited to uh, be in the film festival with you at Unbound. Yes. We didn't even talk about that. Sweet. Yeah. Um, Teaser alert, there's a film festival, Unbound, and Meg and I both have films that are showing in it. So make your way out to Emporia, Kansas in June, even yeah. if you're not racing, uh, to watch our film festivals. So yeah, it's a party. It is a party. Okay. All right. With that, we're going to call it an episode. Thanks again, Meg. Cheers. This is an All Bodies on Bikes podcast powered by Feisty Media. The show is produced by Maggie and Marley and edited by the team at Feisty Media. Thanks for listening.